So I want to talk a little bit about redeeming the atom because we've been trying to harness its power for about seven decades now, and uh, we're not quite there yet. And I think the future of our civilization depends on being able to harness the power and perfect our ability to unleash its, its power. So um, I'll actually go back and, and talk about a little bit of what I've done and, and then talk about what I'm going to do. So I got into nuclear science when I was about 10 years old. Uh, before that, <laughs> I was interested in space and I wanted to build rockets and be an astronaut. And um, I don't know what it was, but something triggered that interest, something I read. And I think it's something about the intrinsic power, the energy density associated with the strong nuclear force that drew me to it. I realized that this had the potential to radically change the world if it was utilized properly. And so I started out, I decided I wanted to build a fusion reactor, um, and I became the youngest person. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was 14, I became the youngest person to produce nuclear fusion uh, with a little device that you can see behind me, uh, this image right here, which was taken by a GoPro, actually, um, which is actually fairly radiation hard, so that's good. Um, what it is is it's inertial electrostatic confinement. So all I'm doing here is essentially replicating the gravity and large amounts of material that you find in a star with essentially electricity. Um, so you, you charge it up to a, a, that inner grid inside there up to a, a very high uh, negatively charged voltage, and you can get a potential well that forms for positively charged ions. In this case, it's deuterium. Now, deuterium is the second isotope of hydrogen, has a proton and a neutron in its nucleus. And what you're seeing behind you is, is behind me, is actually almost a mini star. It's not self-sustaining. It doesn't produce more power out than you put in. But hydrogen atoms are being fused into helium atoms. And out of that reaction comes neutrons. Now, neutrons are very important in nuclear physics. And from that reactor, I developed a bunch of different technologies. Um, the, the first big one that I ended up winning the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair for was a detection system for nuclear material. So uh, I do a lot of work, or, and have done a lot of work, in nuclear nonproliferation and counterterrorism. And one of the huge problems that we face is that uh, with a relatively small amount of material, you can make a weapon that can cause a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, you can think of the attacks of 9-11 that killed thousands of people, would be, uh, would be magnified by orders of magnitude if there had been a nuclear weapon used in, in that similar area. And so this is a huge problem. Uh, luckily, radioactive things, nuclear materials are radioactive, they give off certain radiation, and we can detect that radiation. The problem is the detectors we have right now for detecting something like weapons-grade plutonium use this really rare isotope called helium-3, which we happen to have a lot of on the moon, but down on Earth we can only find it in the pits of old nuclear weapons where we suck it out from the decay of tritium. And so these, ex these detection systems, if they work, are way too expensive and can't be kind of mass-produced like we need to create a net for nuclear terrorism. And so I developed a detector that essentially replaces the, the helium-3 with water, which is the most ubiquitous, inexpensive substance on planet Earth. Um, at least that's the active detection medium. There's a few special tricks and a few special ingredients in there. But now you can, for orders of magnitude less, build actually detectors that are more sensitive than the pre-existing systems. So that's one of the things I did. Uh, I also just decided that um, I wanted to develop a technology uh, to produce medical isotopes very inexpensively because nuclear medicine is one of the best tools we have right now for treating and diagnosing disease. Uh, PET scans uh, are primarily where this is focused, which is the best way to image cancer. It's actually molecular imaging. Instead of just seeing what's there, you can actually see what's going on. You can track biomarkers, biologically relevant molecules. The problem is these isotopes are very short-lived. You can't inject something in the body that's radioactive for very long. And because of that, you can't stockpile them. Uh, so instead of these about an $8 million device that are currently used to produce these isotopes, I developed a system that costs less than $100,000, wills in the hospital room, and produces the isotopes in, in similar quantities on site in the hospital. 
Um, so I was really excited about that. Um, and uh, <laughs> right about now is while I'm thinking I'm going to graduate high school. This was uh, about, a, about a year or two ago. And uh, I decided, well, I'm going to graduate high school soon. And I'd been teaching some graduate students and things about my sophomore year of high school. So I thought, well, do I go you know, to university and continue kind of the academic research I'd been doing? Uh, I was given a lab at the University of Nevada Reno Physics Department to do all this research in during high school. And I decided, no, I, you know, I could license the technology I developed to a big company, a uh, big defense contractor, healthcare company. But I decided when I graduated high school, I wanted to start a commercial, uh, company to commercialize the technology I developed. And, and, and that's what I'm doing now. But uh, I want to segue into to one other thing, um, because I think it is the most important thing I've done with my career. Um, because energy is, <laughs> energy is the most uh, important thing we have. All progress, all economic indicators, anything that we can do requires a source of energy. And a lot of the big problems we talk about, like clean water and healthcare and poverty, at their base have to have a clean, reliable, and cheap source of energy. And that's something that we don't have right now. That's a huge problem. Um, we have energy sources that kill our planet. We have energy sources that are too expensive. And we have energy sources that are finite. Um, and so the one big technology that I have designed is this, this molten salt, uh, it's a molten salt reactor uh, that I've developed uh, that essentially is proliferation and accident resistant. It ru it's buried in the ground and runs for 30 years and it's about half the price of current nuclear power. But most importantly, uh, as opposed to most what they call generation four or generation four plus nuclear technologies. It's not two decades away, like anyone else who is developing these new nuclear technologies is kind of touting. This technology, uh, conservatively, um, could reach market in about five years. Uh, and this has to do with a lot of factors. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it has to do with the fact that there's no real physics problem to overcome. And there's really no real materials problem to overcome. Um, so essentially, you can think of how these work as they're basically a, um, a vat or a pot of these molten salts. So they're halide salts, and they have the fuel dissolved in them. So your coolant and your, your fuel is mixed together. And you essentially extract heat from this, the top of this vessel. You have an active region in the reactor where the nuclear reactions are actually taking place. And because of the thermal co uh, expansive coefficient of the salt, you actually get natural circulation through the core. So as the salt heats up, it gets less dense, goes to the top, you remove heat, goes back through the core, gets heated up, and you get the circulation effect. And these things can't melt down. But most importantly, there's no inclination in any, of, uh, any possible scenario for the radioactive material to leave the core. It's not under 1,000 PSI of pressure, like a light water reactor that we have right now, like the reactors at Fukushima. There are no, there's no chemical reactivity, no potential to generate hydrogen, which can form explosive mixtures with oxygen. And um, so there's no potential for the radioactivity uh, in the core uh, to, to leave the core. And uh, they can be sealed up, and they run for 30 years, so the proliferation threat that goes away, even though there is no technically weapons-grade material in the core. And these can be delivered anywhere in the world. They're manufactured on an assembly line and delivered anywhere in the world to produce power. Now, it's modular. It rolls off the assembly line. And it's only uh, in the range of 2 to 100 megawatts. Now, this is different than uh, some other reactor technology that is larger. Um, but uh, 50 megawatts is the uh, distributed power version. So we're really moving more towards the distributed power uh, mode of generation anyway because of efficiency losses in the grid and renewables. So that's 50 megawatts is your standard you know, small, large town, small cities worth of power, plus the industry load on there. Um, there's a 100 megawatt utility version. And there's actually an 8 megawatt version. Uh, this is electric, 8 megawatt electric um, for uh, certain special applications, so remote villages, and uh, perhaps one of the things I'm most excited about, which is um, spacecraft. Because if we're going to go any past Mars, we run out of solar. And if we want to go to Mars and get there in any short amount of time, uh, we really need nuclear energy. And I tell people that 
all the sources of energy we have right now, whether it's the food that you're eating, whether it's the fossil fuels you're putting in your car, that's essentially like a battery. That is storing energy that you can then transfer to a different form of energy by burning it, combusting it, uh, metabolizing it. Um, because all the original energy that we had came from a nuclear reaction. It came from a nuclear reaction, a fusion reaction uh, in a star. Not only that, but most of the elements that make us up came from that star also. And so I think by perfecting nuclear energy, uh, which I think right now means fission, I think a couple decades out means fusion, uh, we will be able to solve a lot of the problems that we're faced with right now. So appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.